Okay, so I am joined with Matthew Monclar of The String, which has been nominated as a finalist in the horror category at Bunting for Shorts 2021. How are you, Matthew? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. No worries. Um, so for those that don't know you, Matthew, do you want to introduce yourself uh, and how a little bit you got into Sorry, how you got into film? Sure, yeah. So my name is Matthew Monclar. Uh, I'm a French, half French, half Nepalese filmmaker, and uh, I usually work in very no budget uh, films. So, you know, I don't have any money to spare. So that's that's all I can afford right now is just using DIY stuff. And uh, I've been making films for about, I think, two years only. Most people say, you know, they've been making films ever since they were like seven to eight years old. When I was seven to eight years old, I just thought about playing football. Okay. I didn't think of becoming <laughs> a filmmaker yet, but it's, it's only like recently that I, I, I always loved cinema, but I've, I've sort of, sort of focused all of my efforts to become a filmmaker. And I just love cinema as a whole. And uh, I've only make, been making serious short films for about yeah two years, I think. Awesome. So what was it that a couple of years ago then that sparked the note within you to say, okay, I now want to do this. I want to go for this. Was there anything in particular? Well, I, I think is the thing is I've always liked stories as a whole. And like, I used to play around with toys and just recreate scenes from movies and things like that, you know, and it's, I've always had an interest in cinema to me. That's like the most interesting uh, fictional art form, you mm. know, and uh, I don't know, I think at some point in your life, you know, when uh, you're in your last couple of years of high school and you need to decide what you want to do in the future, it's always a tough question to ask yourself, right? Because you're like 16 years old and your parents are putting pressure on you to find a job that's like financially stable. And then on one side, you want to follow your dream, but you're thinking, well, your dream is sort of this nigh impossible endeavor that's probably <laughs> never going to be successful. So... I sort of asked myself a question when I'm 60 years old, you know, maybe on my deathbed, let's just say, and I reflect on my life. What, what did I achieve? At least now I can say, Oh, well, I made a couple of short films that I can show my grandchildren. So I suppose yeah. that's, uh, I think when you're making a film as well, it's like, it's, it's your passion project, isn't it? It's uh, it's something you can say, I made that from scratch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is obviously a really nice feeling. And The String is uh, a zero budget horror film. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what it's about without obviously giving too much away? Yeah, well, I mean, the whole synopsis is a man's daily routine gets interrupted by these sinister omens and a mysterious string. That's that's uh, as far as I can go in terms of description for the film. And... Uh, well, I mean, how can I talk about the film without spoiling it? it? It's sort of... If we say spoiler warning from then on, feel free to say what you want. Oh, okay, right, right, right. Well, spoiler, spoiler warning, yeah. So it, 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 what I wanted with the film, the, the, the whole inspiration for the film was basically the visual imagery of strings. I found that, you know, just like threads and things like that, hmm. they have such an important place in myths and legends. Like when you think about like Greek myths, for instance, you know, you have the whole... Uh, the uh, what's it called? The Minotaur's Labyrinth, right? And you have yeah. a thesis with the string. I don't know. There was something that I found very visually pleasing in, and it it held a lot of thematic significance, you know, because when you have strings and threads in movies, they usually represent death or, or destiny or how you're basically linked to something. And it, it's an idea that that I've been working around. And then I saw this completely other film called a single man with colin firth yeah 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 really good film uh, has nothing to do with uh, the string uh, not at all the same subject matter <laughs> but there's a specific shot where colin firth's character is just lying on the ground oh uh, no lying in his bed i think and the camera is just facing his feet and it looks like he's in a morgue Right. He's just a body in a morgue. And we were analyzing that scene in, in my film class. And someone pointed out how basically uh, all that was missing was a name tag on his big toe. <laughs> and, and, and that's it. Right. And from there, I just connected the two dots from, you know, the visual imagery of strings with that scene. And the string just developed from there onwards. I think that's one of the, the scenes that's quite prominent in the string as well, is that 
toe shot, which is a really strange sure, sure. thing to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the fact that then it obviously develops and you obviously learn a bit more about what the string's connected to, as you say. So yeah. obviously connection's quite a big aspect of the film. Um, what was it, other than the idea of just in exploring string, was there anything else that sort of made you want to delve into the idea of connection and destiny? Well, uh, I mean, it was... It was a whole bunch of things. I think what, one of the main aspects was foreshadowing. Mm. And uh, I really like films that have a buildup. I mean, most of my films usually, even if it's just start off really slow and then gradually things get worse. And that was exactly the whole principle of the string, right? It's like the first third of the movie is just this typical banal morning routine that you've seen a thousand times. But there's this atmosphere and some some element of it just make it feel like there's something wrong in the air and so you don't really know what it is but and as as you gradually move through the film and and you get to the last of the film where all of the pieces of the puzzle basically just get together right that's where you see what the buildup was leading towards and so that whole idea of having a a, a loop you know a self-fulfilling prophecy that's the whole uh, structure behind the film. Hmm. And I think that's quite prevalent in some of your other work as well. So off the back, we obviously had a little little delve into the archives and uh, with the printer, it's the same kind of oh yeah, uh, same kind of structure and it kind of makes your style yours. Is that something you intentionally do with each film sort of have have your own spin on it or is it more the story that leads to the style well yeah I've, I've asked the other day I was with my family and I just rewatched all of the films I showed them again you know <laughs> and I just noticed that yeah they have a lot of that building up thing and I don't know if it has to do with the emotions that are associated with that buildup you know, I think that in any sort of context, not even just horror or tension or suspense, you know, even in comedy or action, I think it's all a matter of not giving too much too quickly, just taking your time, you know, easing your audience in. And then once they're ready, you just blow everything in their faces. <laughs> and, and I mean, the funny, the funny anecdote with uh, uh, the string is that if you've ever, ever done a, a writing course, and you look at the three act structure narrative, it looks exactly like a heartbeat, uh, right? Uh. <laughs> and and it's, it's behind the whole thematic of the string, of course. I think everything, there's so many subtle references within it as well. Um, one that I really, really like that I, uh, is the, the pot in the kitchen with the smiley face on it. And it's clear there's a bit of like jam or something dropped down on it as if it's like blood or something. And there's so many like small yeah. details for if people do obviously watch it a few times, you start to pick up on those. I'm really glad you noticed that because I think you're the first person who said it. <laughs> most, most people were just like, why, why the hell is there like this smiley face coming out of nowhere? And I'm like, oh, rewatch it again, you know? <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah. It's... With that, it's, um, it felt quite Dexterish. I don't know if you've seen much Dexter, but the, uh, the opening yeah. scene to Dexter obviously uses sort of fruit kitchen equipment just to build that kind of gritty atmosphere um, exactly yeah and i, I really the like eggs that the eggs are uh, being cut in half yeah, yeah i think that intro was uh, pretty good yeah all of those kinds of things sort of filled it feed into it and also you've branded it as a grim fable uh in the title and also in sort of the biography bit you also mentioned inside number nine as a as an inspiration what is it about those uh, well, books and films, uh, books and TV series, sorry, that particularly mm. inspires you? I don't know if it's, you know, I think I like fairy tales a lot, mm. but not the sort of Disney ones. You know, I, I like the original Brothers Grimm fairy tales that are really grim. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's something that I like about these fairy tales is that they deal with these universal thematics you know, like the, to me, the main thematic with this was death, right? And so you have this main character who just goes about his 
daily routine. And he has all these omens literally in his face, right? But just like the audience, you don't notice it because they look so banal and innocuous that you just, your rational mind just dismisses them. Mm. And I, I like, you know, you were mentioning the printer, but I think the printer follows the same sort of fairy tale narrative in the sense that you have a character doing something and at the end being punished for whatever he did. So in the case of the string, it's of course just his ignorance of of those uh, mysterious omens that he's being faced with that cause his own demise. And uh, when when I was doing some research for the string, just to have some influences, there was this Brothers Grimm fairy tale that I had never heard of called The Godfather Death. I don't know. And that one. what's that about? Yeah, I, I didn't know that one either. It, it was a very obscure one, I think. And uh, just it, it has a very different story from the string. Uh, but in one of, of, of the paragraphs, they describe death appearing uh, right at the bedside. At, I think it was at the bed end of a character. Hmm. And so I thought, oh, wow. So I can totally make the connection between the two there. And, and it just developed from there. Wow. And it's really nice to see that, okay, I've seen this now. Okay, I can incorporate that, but make it my own as well. Sure. Um, who knew that uh, a bed sheet <laughs> could, could be quite exactly. uh, could be quite menacing <laughs> as well. Um, you shot the film in black and white as well and with no dialogue. That's obviously quite different. It's quite a brave decision. Um, what is it about obviously making it therefore universal uh, as an aspect, but... What is it with the black and white and the no dialogue that's interesting as well? Well, I think first with no dialogue, I think it's just, well, one, there's of course the practicalities of it, right? I think that a lot of student films are hindered by bad dialogue or bad delivery. Mm -hmm. And since I'm my own main actor and I know that my acting chops are pretty mediocre <laughs> when I have dialogue, I didn't want to challenge myself with that. But I also thought that, well, you know, cinema is a visual medium. So your story should be told without any words spoken on screen, right? You should understand everything through the, the shots and the editing. Mm. So I, I just wanted to translate that purely visually. And I think not having any dialogue just made the whole thing much more ominous. You know, like just this silence. I think silence is is overlooked in movies you know there's always a, a, a musical score in the background or or something that's adding to the film but really i think it hinders it because i think having a, a silence uh, uh yeah silence moment is so much more impactful uh, in a scene that that builds up to something you it's know and the black and white yeah sorry go ahead that's oh, right. It's the audience aren't naturally used to quietness, are they? Obviously, sure, when yeah. you're watching the film, you've got all the atmosphere. You're talking to your friend, maybe, or whatever, and then silence. And it's what yeah. to do in the silence. I really like that. Yeah. People don't like silence. I mean, you'll notice it in like any conversation that you have with anyone. If there's like a pause or something, people will be like awkward <laughs> because naturally we're just being taught uh, through societal constructs that silence is bad, right? So I just like that idea. Awesome. And then you were going to say about the uh, black and white as well. Well, the black and white, actually, uh, the funny thing is that it wasn't black and white at all at the beginning. And it, I changed it later on. And uh, I, I shot it in colors and it was supposed to be a very sort of dull gray. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was still in, in that sense, you know, muted colors, but it just didn't look good at all. And I, I showed the first draft to some of my family to to get some feedback and they were like mm, you know there's something missing something about the whole grain of 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 the picture and i thought well it's it's a film that talks about death the afterlife destiny it's it's you know those are like monolithic concepts and black and white is like the perfect for me color grading for these sorts of thematics and especially if you play around with that because of course the first two-thirds of the film are in black and white and then at some point colors reappear and uh, they help with the reveal i think as well definitely especially with like the the heart rate monitor there's a, yeah. a small bit of color there and i think it's more is it an idea of sort of drawing your eye to it or is it as you said more about the impact of that 
particular thing within the film? I think it's a bit of both, you know, and it, it has to do a lot with how the film is structured because you have the first third of the movie that's sort of reality. Then you have this, the, the, the second part, which is this purgatory kind of. And then the third pa- part is like back to grim reality again. Yeah. And so it was to further emphasize that transition between each section, right? Have, have uh, the ending in the hospital bed, have all the colors just in complete contrast with the completely black background and, and uh, the lighting and all of that. Mm. And that was an idea that came from your family, uh, partially. The, the color grading, yeah. But for the cinematography, it came from another film of mine that I had made ages ago. It was another horror uh, short film. And I, I realized how effective it was to just bathe your room in complete darkness and mm. just have one flashlight on the ceiling. And it was just like the perfect cinematography uh, hack that I found that I thought, oh, God, I got to use this again. Because that's another thing people don't like is darkness. Yeah, yeah, darkness exactly. And silence. I think you can put that on for a couple of minutes and people <laughs> freak <Yeah>. out. <laughs> um, so when you uh, show your family, are they quite a big influence in the final products? But are they also an influence in terms of the original starting out to do with like the filmmaking the ideas as well or no <laughs> well actually uh, i'm going to develop on that but not that much in the sense that i don't i don't like to trust my family uh in terms of their opinions on my own films or even my friends for that matter because i know that they'll either be too lenient on me because well i'm their family or, or friends right or they'll be too harsh and so it, it's really just finding a balance of the two so that's why i prefer to just follow my own judgment and be critical of my own work Hmm. and uh, i think that doing short films no budget short films especially it just teaches you so much about yourself as a filmmaker because well you're overseeing every single aspect of a film so you know where your weaknesses are and you know where your strengths are and so when it comes to later on you know if ever you were to make a a more ambitious project with more people involved you can delegate tasks depending on where your weaknesses are and what you should focus on so i'm mostly just very critical of my own work and uh, i i'll maybe ask my family uh, at the end of the film what they think of it if they understood it just to have a different audience perspective but I think it's better to have someone who's completely unrelated to you. I mean, that's why um, I really appreciate, you know, you selecting my film and just showing it to people is because, well, then you get to see how people react to your film from a completely different perspective. And so what has the audience uh, response been in general, obviously, aside from friends and family that you know? um, What's it been like online and obviously the festival response? Um, I mean, so far it's been good. I, I was selected at one or two film festivals. And uh, I mean, there's some YouTube comments that are always friendly, uh, some haters as well. But uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, I'm, I'm personally satisfied with the film because I know it's my most ambitious film, which hmm. isn't saying much when you look at the others. <laughs> but uh, I, I know that uh, it's, it's definitely my, my proudest uh, accomplishment but I also know that I could do better. Yeah, and I think uh, as long as you're happy with it, I suppose, is one of the main things. But then obviously you know for whatever comes next, okay, I could do this. Uh, Oh, I forgot about this in this film, but then I could try this and obviously then start to expand budgets, expand to to different actors and things. Um, I mean, as as long as people understand it, I I, I showed it to my dad and he said, oh, really? I thought the directing was good, but I didn't understand anything to the plot. So I'm like, oh, gosh. (laughs) (laughs) So this is funny. You will always get those people that just completely completely flies over, I suppose. But um, what is coming next then in terms of Cheap Thrills Productions? Um, well, for now, uh, I have a few short films that I made with a friend that I'm, we, we already shot back in October and we're still trying to edit them. And, uh, then I also have lots of personal projects, uh, to work on. I mean, with COVID there's nothing else to do. So I'm just going to keep making films, uh, on my own. 
And what's it been like uh, with COVID trying to make films? Has it, has it hindered you in any way? I know obviously you're quite a self-produced production. Well, I mean, yeah, exactly. You, you, you pretty much hit the, the, the nail on the head. Is that, is that an expression? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because before COVID, I, I just, I was a one-man crew. So when people, you know, started to say, oh gosh, I don't have equipment. I don't have budget. I don't have cameraman or an editor. I'm like, well, that was me before. So it, it, there wasn't that much of a change at all. And I actually find it to be really um, interesting to work in a no budget environment because, well, having all these limitations, ironically enough, it, it really expands your creative horizons mm. because all of a sudden what you're doing is you're just problem solving, right? So for instance, in, in, in my script for the string, I had this idea for the hospital scene. And then I realized, oh, wait, I don't have access to a hospital and we're right in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> How the hell am I going to get a hospital scene? And then I just thought, well, what does a hospital bed look like, right? And you just come up with these DIY alternatives. You know, you take, instead of tubes, you take USB cables. Instead, instead of bandages, you take, well, old white socks. And instead of a, a heart monitor, you have just a laptop with a YouTube video on repeat. You know, these sorts of like DIY alternatives. And the final product is pretty believable in the extent that, well, because you're bathing everything in, in darkness, right? You don't really see any of, of the, the what, what's the word, the flaws mm. of the set. But you, and you don't that, need the background in this case, because obviously the sure. atmosphere builds within the darkness as well. Exactly. But yeah, so that's why I, I, I really enjoy working in, in no budget short films. And I think that right now with COVID, it, it's a really great opportunity to uh, hone your creative skills. Mm. And Obviously, obviously, you've got a lot of uh, solo projects coming up, but in the future, would you like to expand to, obviously having a budget would be nice, but um, expand to more ambitious, more crew, that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, it's just that I don't think that I'm that ready for it yet. You know, I just want to experiment more with what I currently have. Obviously, yeah. it's very limiting because uh, now I've done like, a dozen of short films and I'm the only actor. So that's also very limiting, right? When you only have one character in your film, you there's only a limit to how many stories you can tell in that context. So yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, hopefully someday uh, if I'm able to, uh, I don't know, go on a crowdfunding platform or, or something along those lines to just self-finance a small medium length film, that would be great. Hmm. And would you stick with the the sort of horror dark comedy genre because I know that's quite a quite a universal yeah. tone for your films uh, um I think horror as a whole is my favorite genre uh -huh. but I mean you must you must know this but ho genres are like it's 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 pointless to categorize movies into genres because it's not like there's a specific box right yeah, exactly it it's every genre just uh, converges with each other so horror in of itself is just so vast because you have you know technically thriller that that's a part of horror as well so uh i think horror is my favorite genre but you know i wouldn't mind delving into uh, science fiction i really love sci-fi uh even drama action anything as long as i have uh, an interesting story to tell mm, and is there any particular horror films and sci-fi films that you love like what, what's your favorites <laughs> Yeah, there's plenty. Uh, I mean, sci-fi horror, my favorite has got to be The Thing, John Carpenter's yeah, yeah. The Thing. I, I, I absolutely love that film. And uh, I mean, in horror, it's tough. It, it's, it, I'm, I'm really picky about my films, usually. So um, the funny thing is that the, the films that I watched that really scared me weren't necessarily horror films. Mm. So for instance, Lord of the Rings, uh, I think it's the the two towers when you have the uh, intro of uh, Gollum's origins. Oh, I see. That absolutely traumatized me. Like when he eats the fish and he he transforms into this Gollum-looking creature. As a child, I was absolutely terrified of that, and uh, I, I now I just love it. It's yeah. It's, I, I, it's always fun to look back at what you were scared of as a kid and be like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Really. <laughs> 
<laughs> Amazing. So obviously we can expect to see some more short films coming up on Cheap Thrills Productions. Um, but do you want to let everybody know that's watching this um, where to find your work on socials and obviously what your YouTube handle is as well? Sure. Well, there's my YouTube channel, uh, Cheap Thrills Productions. There's also my uh, Facebook page of the same name and my website also of the same name. So just, just type Cheap Thrills Productions, Matthew Monclar, you'll find it. Nice and easy to find then. Well, yeah, thank perfect. you so much for your time, Matthew. Really appreciate thank it. Uh, and we'll end it there then. Yeah. Thank you very much. No worries.